Now that we've seen the hypersensitivities, and we can now move on to immunodeficiencies. Uh, there are many ways to have an, an, an immunodeficiency. We've already explored one. You can have an immunodeficiency by being on immunosuppressants, right? By being treated for a hypersensitivity or autoimmunity. You can develop a deficient immune response. So that would be sort of an iatrogenic immunodeficiency. Uh, but you can also have congenital uh, immunodeficiency. And then again, the secondary non-immune system disorders that affect immune function. So we'll see some examples of that. Our first one is going to be a severe combined immunodeficiency disorder. It's inherited, it's genetic, and it's going to be associated with impairment of T and B cells. So basically this kid has no specific immunity. This is a bubble boy, if you guys have heard about the bubble boy. Literally has no specific immune system and cannot function exposed to the pathogens that we are all exposed to every single day. That, that most severe form reticular dysgenesis is what we're talking about. You're starting off. Okay. Wiscott Aldrich syndrome is an X linked immunodeficiency disorder that affects both T and B cells. Um, and then we also have DeGeorge which is going to be also known as thymic hypoplasia. It's a deletion of this specific gene. I'm not going to hold you to 22Q11.2. That doesn't do anything for you. Um, DeGeorge is associated with a lot of things. Um, in this case, it's the, the, the outcome of your thymus gland not functioning. What was the thymus gland? What does the thymus do? It's the dojo. What do we mean by it's the dojo? It's where your T lymphocytes go to train and become efficient killers of specific pathogens, right? So uh, having a complete and utter lack of a thymus means there's no dojo for your ninjas to train in, which means you can't kill those things, right? You'll still have the synthesis by the red bone marrow because that's where all of your blood cells are coming from is the bone marrow, but they don't have a development site. So again, with DeGeorge, there are a lot of other congenital problems going on, uh, but the thing, we're talking about it here in terms of how it can impact the immune system. Yes? Is there Being asplenic, uh, remember that the spleen is a site of certain B cells developing. So yes, you would be lacking the sort of B memory and the plasma cell synthesis if you were lacking a spleen, and we would consider you uh, a being uh, immunodeficient if you're asplenic. Asplenic can be an absence of a spleen or it can be your spleen's still there but it's no longer functional. So these are all T and B cell disorders affecting different points. Again, it's a list where three similar things and you need to differentiate them. Okay, some autoimmune disorders. Once again, I've collected autoimmune disorders from different lectures and tried to mostly put them in one spot, that having been said, things like lupus are going to pop up time and time again. So we'll start with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I do believe we'll see this again during our endocrine lecture. It's an autoimmune destruction of thyroid hormone secreting cells. Um, so again, this is something that will make more sense during an endocrine lecture. Initially, here's the thing about your hormones. A lot of your glands that synthesize hormones are synthesizing them regularly and storing them and secreting them in a controlled way, right? That is true for thyroid hormone. You synthesize quite a bit of T4 and T3, which are thyroid hormones, and you store them in colloid right there. When you start destroying the cells of the thyroid gland, you initially release a bunch of thyroid hormone. What's thyroid hormone going to do? What's it going to do to your metabolism, increase or decrease? Increase initially. And then all of your thyroid hormone secreting cells are dead, and now you're going to have high or low thyroid hormone. Low. So Hashimoto's can actually kind of have a combination of high and low metabolic rate. It may start as one and end as the other. So when we get to endocrine, we're actually going to see it in both hypersecretion disorders and hyposecretion disorders. And that's going to be a little confusing, but we'll get to it when we get to it. So 
You know, I've seen people have weird pathways with it. It should be high first, low later. But I always do like regimented, this is what this disease is. The reality of it's always gonna be more complex than that. Addison disease is an autoimmune disorder leading to destruction of the adrenal cortex, which means you need to remember the adrenal cortex hormones. Again, this is not endocrine weak, so I'll just tell you it's mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, and sex steroid hormones are being destroyed. So we're going to have problems with electrolyte balance, inflammation and sugar balance, and uh, additional sex steroids as otherwise created aside from what your gonads are created. When you have problems with those things, you'll have dehydration, dizziness, fainting, fatigue, lightheadedness, life, lack of ap appetite, and so on. Again, that will make more sense during endocrine lecture. There's a nice plump adrenal cortex, and there's the destruction of the adrenal gland occurring up here. So good histology, bad histology. Multiple sclerosis is really complicated, um, and we barely understand it. We know it's an autoimmune condition. We don't know which type of hypersensitivity it falls under. What we're really experiencing is scarring of the myelin sheath in the central nervous system, which will have peripheral effects. We'll also see demyelination in the periphery, but it's actually a slightly separate mechanism that is poorly understood. Uh, and again, the symptoms of multiple, multiple sclerosis are gonna be associated with what part of the brain is scarring. So you'll look at an MRI, you'll see patches of scar tissue forming within the brain. And depending on where that scar tissue is, very commonly the optic nerve, the oculomotor nerve, and some spinal nerve tracts, uh, that's going to cause different symptomology. Any questions about MS? Well, I think we'll address this one again later too. Hopefully we do. Exactly, so all of these we would consider polygenic and multifactorial. We was, we've found probably multiple genes for multiple sclerosis, but some people will develop it and some won't. Uh, and it's unclear what that environmental trigger is. I personally have a hypothesis about some environmental pollutions and I'd be happy to personally have that conversation with you, but probably not put it on the recording because it's, uh, it's based on some things that I've seen, but it's anecdotal and not really science. Uh, Denver is an MS hotspot, so you are very likely to encounter MS if you haven't already. So myasthenia gravis, I've already mentioned, is autoimmune destruction of acetylcholine receptors. You've seen a lot of acetylcholine in your time with me. At least you should have. Our first ever neurotransmitter was acetylcholine. Does anybody remember what cell releases acetylcholine or name a cell that, or where we're releasing acetylcholine onto and in what scenario? Nerves secrete acetylcholine onto muscles. The neuromuscular junction is the first place we ever saw acetylcholine. So your muscle contraction is based on acetylcholine receptors binding acetylcholine and that triggering action potentials within muscle cells. And that's really the major place where this comes into play or this is the really obvious place where this comes into play. So you have destruction of acetylcholine receptors, therefore no matter how much acetylcholine your neuron can release, your cell can't respond to it. You can't have action potentials in your muscle cells, which means muscles can't contract. So you're going to have manifestations of profound muscle weakness and fatigability. Yes? So Bell's palsy is a palsy of cranial nerve seven, which could happen for a number of reasons. Uh, it could be inflammatory, it could be a simple nerve impingement, it could be infectious, most likely it's viral. Not necessarily, no. I imagine you could have an autoimmune sort of inflammation that could potentially block cranial nerve seven, um, but you're probably dealing with other things aside from Bell's palsy at that point. This droopy eyelid is called ptosis, by the way. And that's a sign 
Um, I think there's a phrase that often goes with myasthenia gravis. It gets worse with exercise and better with rest. I believe that goes with this. Rheumatoid arthritis we will see again when we get to joint musculoskeletal. It's an autoimmune condition attacking tissues inside of joint spaces, especially small non-weight bearing joints. That small non-weight bearing joints is gonna be how we ultimately differentiate it compared to osteoarthritis. Uh, and of course, the fact that it's autoimmune. Osteoarthritis, as far as we know, is not autoimmune. That autoimmune reaction to joint spaces can absolutely lead to loss of function um, and of course, quite a bit of pain. It tends to be, the presentation tends to be bilaterally symmetrical. It'll both happen in both hands equally, smaller joints. And it, there will be diffuse musculoskeletal pain. It won't be just in obvious affected joints. As I've already mentioned, lupus is gonna come up again and again. We'll see it in conjunction with joint pain, inflammation of the synovium, and of course, skin lesions, butterfly rashes, and systemic involvement. Um, oh my gosh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. I know what an ANA is, but I have to look it up anyway because um, I'm spacing it. ANA test. Anti-nuclear antibody test. So it means you're positive for the antibodies associated with the destruction of your own cells. Yeah. But the reason some of these slides are repeating is because I grabbed them out of different lectures where different lectures were addressing the same condition. So again, lupus can affect joint, skin, kidneys, blood cells, brain, heart, and lungs. And there's our butterfly-shaped rash that is characteristic of that. Not necessarily, yeah. If you watch House a lot, it's never lupus. Um, <laughs> but they always think it's lupus. Never is. She has great eyelashes. That's your takeaway, is the eyelashes. Yeah, Bill. Uh, again, I don't know. I think so, because of the vascular in nature. Okay, uh, those were autoimmune. We'll move on to simple inflammatory conditions. I do want to take a little sidebar here and say inflammation, we're really realizing systemic inflammation is to blame for more and more things as we uncover things in science. We're starting to think that um, osteoarthritis isn't just about wear and tear, it's about inflammation in joint spaces that lends itself to wear. That uh, atherosclerotic development in your blood vessels in your heart isn't just you're depositing fat into your blood vessels, it's systemic inflammation of blood vessels that leads to the wear and tear on blood vessels that causes buildup of plaque. We're really starting to blame inflammation for pretty much everything. I went at that anatomical conference I went to, a guy swore up and down that uh, Alzheimer's disease was caused by the same bacteria that causes gingivitis and the systemic inflammation that res results in that. He had some strong evidence for it. He's probably a little too sure of himself, uh, but the evidence is good actually for, that he presented. So that even Alzheimer's may be inflammatory in nature. Systemic inflammation absolutely does things to you and causes damage, yes. CT? Uh, uh, what they went over like, TBIs? I'll look it up later. We can talk about it. Okay, so inflammatory conditions. Uh, we'll have a whole week for things that physically happen to your brain, including inflammation. We can address it then. Uh, okay, so pemphigus. Uh, you've got pemphigus vulgaris, pemphigus vegetans, pemphigus fol uh, foliaceous. There we go. 
means your skin is blus blistering. And we do consider this an autoimmune reaction against your skin cells and basement membrane. Oh, there we go. And then finally, psoriasis is also considered autoimmune. It's considered inherited. Um, and it's not contagious because it is autoimmune and not in, and inherited. This is sort of going to be a sort of silvery plaque on thing, places like knees, elbows, so on and so forth. Okay, so those were our autoimmune and inflammatory autoimmune conditions. There's a whole chapter on HIV and AIDS, and it deserves a whole chapter. Um, so HIV is the virus. AIDS is acquired autoimmune deficiency, uh, acquired immune deficiency disorder. The virus leads to AIDS. It's not that you have HIV, therefore you have AIDS. You have HIV, and then you can develop and progress in some cases. So the HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, infects CD4 cells, which means your helper T lymphocytes. And you know that cascades, so you know those are the guys responsible for releasing cytokines and initiating an immune response. So when, and it's a retrovirus, which means it's got enzymes that will add the genetic code for HIV into the genetic code of your T helper cells. So during latent infection, as you can see, the virus uh, that our viral RNA has been, or proviral DNA in this case, has been spliced into the human genome. And then of course, that T helper cell now becomes a factory for new viruses. This may be slightly out of date chart. This is from 2008. As I understand it, it's still fairly accurate. Um, the USA being one of the uh, the, the, the developing nation with the worst HIV outcomes. For a developing nation, we are not doing well with the spread of HIV. HIV is still spreading and increasing in the United States, whereas most developed nations have controlled the spread of HIV. Again, some of our numbers are going to be a little bit of out of date. 33.3 million living with HIV is a better phrase for that worldwide. 1.8 million AIDS deaths worldwide, 68% in Sub-Saharan Africa. So as you can see, there's the Sahara Desert, Sub-Saharan Africa being that region right there. But it is spreading in Asia and Eastern Europe. And again, our numbers in the United States are not doing great. I added this slide because I do think your textbook has some biases about the spread of HIV. And I definitely want to address those biases about the spread of HIV. Again, slightly out of date, but more than 600,000 persons living with HIV just in the United States with 56,000 annual infections, which currently is increasing, unfortunately. And here's where I think your textbook starts to get a little bit biased. 75% um, of new, new HIV infections occurring in men who have sex with men. Um, Okay, so one thing I want to address here is that the LGBT community knows about HIV and is very well educated about HIV and the spread of HIV, often better than some medical personnel that I've met. And this is a little bit personal and anecdotal where, you know, the people who I've talked about in the general population versus the, the LGBTQI community, um, the knowledge level is very, very different in my opinion, in my experience. Um, so what we're really finding for demographics for new HIV infections is that uh, women of color are actually the fastest growing demographic. It's about socioeconomic status, it's about education, and it's about empowerment, who's contracting HIV. It's not just about promiscuity, it's not just about social norms. Um, so I think your textbook's a little bit off on some of this, yes. Yes. There is that too, yes. Um, we've called AIDS a lot of things. <laughs> really, derogatory. really derogatory terms. And I'm glad you guys bring that up. I always get on a soapbox about this. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the AIDS quilt. So the HIV epidemic, the AIDS epidemic really happened in the 1980s during the Reagan administration. And during that time period, Ronald Reagan and his administration did not say the word HIV or AIDS. They had no public initiatives to stem 
the tides. They did absolutely nothing to prevent the spread of HIV. They did not address it because at the time, culturally being gay was considered being very bad. It was predominantly spreading through the community of men who have sex with men and having unprotected sex. Yes, definitely more in the African-American community. There was not equality. So this was the AIDS quilt. We went to Washington. We made a square from everybody who died of AIDS uh, and we showed the Reagan administration the impact of their policies. And it's still growing. We're still working on it. Uh, one thing that Microsoft has done recently, I don't usually you know, toot that Microsoft horn, but they've been trying to collect the AIDS quilt and digitize it and make it something permanent since a quilt is a little bit more ephemeral. And make sure that we don't forget that period of history where we completely ignored the needs of a minority community. No, they weren't treating. Yeah, you, they didn't know which safety precautions to take. People thought you couldn't touch somebody with HIV. People were missing just physical touch, holding hands and being hugged in their last days. I actually just read a story of a nurse. I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, uh, but I think she worked, I want to say in Alabama, a southern state that had really high HIV rates, again, because there was little education about it. She was the only nurse in Alabama willing to work with HIV positive patients and working with the AIDS population. She spent her own money to get people cremated and she put on funerals for her patients because their family would not come to their funerals. Yeah. It's a depressing time. It's a depressing story. Um, I want to say it's all because it's the bad old days, but honestly, it's 2019 and we're still dealing with a lot of hate. So, yeah. Uh, again, uh, there are things that HIV predisposes you to, like Kaposi sarcoma is a type of cancer. So, yes, we used to call it gay cancer. And then I forget what graph stands for, but you're right about that. Yeah, gay related something autoimmune deficient something I don't know really really bad and again it has nothing to do with being gay it is simply transmitted sexually through uh, contact with infected tissue or cells or blood or plasma or semen um, I don't think plasma is the right word right it's required yeah permeability is absolutely necessary uh, oral epithelium doesn't spread it can kiss an HIV per positive person and be fine. And of course we have this new news that undetectable is untransmittable. And that's brand new. It's not gonna be in your textbook for probably five years. Um, and healthcare is woefully behind the tide of what actually is happening in HIV research. So we'll keep going. And then we will talk about PrEP and we will talk about uh, some, other issues, some other treatments for it as well. So there are multiple strains of HIV. It is a virus and it is always mutating and changing. So there's HIV-1 and HIV-2. There are subtypes within these, but by and large, there's the two major types. HIV-1 was thought to have originated in Central Africa. It's most AIDS cases around the world or HIV cases around uh, Africa, United States, Europe, and Australia. There are, again, subtypes of it. There's also HIV variant 2 thought to have originated in West Africa. It's considered a milder form of the disease, but it can progress to AIDS. And again, AIDS is the thing that kills you. Being immunodeficient, having no T cells left, and then having no specific immunity creates an opportunity for opportunistic infections and the opportunistic infections kill you. Yes. People are living with it for years because we are developing better and better treatment protocols, which we will look at. So there's sexual transmission, parenteral transmission, and perinatal transition. And again, your textbook's a little behind. I've got some really good news for HIV positive parents. If you are being treated for HIV, if you keep your viral load very low throughout pregnancy, transmission perinatally from mother to child is very, very low. Last I heard it was at 2%. I'm sure we've improved since I've heard that percentage. So the likelihood for somebody successfully being treated, being compliant with their treatment protocol, if an HIV mother can absolutely give birth to an HIV a negative offspring and have a perfectly healthy baby. 
Um, I'm not entirely sure. I imagine so, especially with our understanding of undetectable as untransmittable. If, I imagine if, but I don't know that that research has been done, so I can't promise that. Yes. I don't think so. I'm not familiar. Good Karen Riley question. Okay, uh, blood, blood products, needles, needle sharing being a really common one. This is a good argument in favor of having safe hygienic needle exchange programs. I know that's controversial. This is just some evidence in favor of it. If we give people a place where they can get clean needles and that they can get them for free and trade them in, trade in their used needles, we can stem the tide of HIV transmission and other bloodborne diseases like several kinds of hepatitis. Um, it's a public health and safety measure, and that's science. That's not just my opinion. Your personal beliefs about addiction can go beyond that, but we're not talking about that. Uh, and then, of course, sexual transmission. Originally, we've associated it very strongly with the promiscuous homosexual community. However, it can be from any sort of sexual contact, technically. Um, oral sex is less likely to do that, but if you've ever had a cut on the roof of your mouth, then that break in the epithelial barrier can absolutely be an entry, a portal of entry. Again, this is a retrovirus. It has a core, a nucleocapsid, uh, RNA strands, protein and enzymes, surrounded by a lipid viral, uh, li lipid bilayer viral envelope. And what we're looking at here, I'll go ahead and zoom in on some of this. Over here, we're going to have our sort of viral life cycle where we have the HIV virion adhering to the plasma membrane of the cell, injecting viral RNA, utilizing reverse transcriptase to put its genetic information into our chromosomal DNA. And then of course, using our cellular mechanisms to produce new virions. Now what we're going to see over, whoops, yeah, it, or, maybe let this do a thing. No, I don't, <laughs> just zoom out, dude. What are you doing? Stop it. <laughs> I don't know why this is being so hard for me right now. Erase, there we go. Go away. It's because I've gone away. I don't even have it on draw anymore. And so over on this side of the slide, what we're saying is um, there are a variety of medications that we can give to people to block, for example, the fusion of the virion to the plasma membrane. We can block uh, that reverse transcriptase. We can block the production of new virions. So when we give drugs to people with HIV, those drugs are targeting this pathway of how this virus is utilizing this cell. And in the olden days, our HIV cocktail was really, really intense. We required very, very many pills in order to successfully suppress viral loads. Um, and there were many, many side effects. We are getting more and more fine-tuned drug. Our HIV cocktail is decreasing in size and complexity, and our side effects are decreasing as we refine, refine those as well. That South Park episode that said that the cure for AIDS is about $180,000, that's fairly accurate. The, the progression of HIV is very much about your socioeconomic status, your ability to pay for these drugs that uh, will reduce your viral loads. Hopefully, yes, it zoomed out properly. Okay, so again, we do have HIV cocktails. We have a variety of drugs that target a variety of places. There's something new that a lot of the healthcare profession is behind on, and it's called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. If you know that you are in a demographic or a life situation in which you are more likely to contract HIV, you can go on pre-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP. So for example, maybe you have an HIV positive partner, but you or yourself are HIV negative, or perhaps you have a promiscuous lifestyle, you can decide to get on PrEP. There are a lot of regulations behind it. You need to be tested for HIV on a very regular basis if that's what you're doing at least for the time being, because this is brand spanking new. And of course, you have to be able to afford PrEP, which is its own issue. But with PrEP, with a regular regimen of pre-exposure prophylaxis, 
we have been able to prevent people from contracting HIV in the first place. We don't have a vaccine yet, but we have a drug cocktail that does prevent successfully HIV contraction. It's so cool. And there's so many healthcare professionals who don't know this exists. I have uh, LGBT friends who are teaching their primary care physicians about PrEP. Yes. Because they're more educated in this generation. Um, yes, absolutely. So everybody in this room knows about it. Spread the word. It's good news. Yes. Yeah, and that's probably where this came from, was if you get a needle stick, we're going to have some prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis in that case. Um, and then it works. And of course, using condoms and safer sex practices is going to greatly decrease the spread of HIV infection, along with other STIs, such as hepatitis, such as gonorrhea, chlamydia, all of them, right? So use condoms. Uh, and we've kind of gone through this reverse transcriptase, proteases. Um, so there's a progression of HIV infection. One of the reasons it's so insidious is that it has very lengthy latent periods. So there's your normal sort of T cell count before uh, viral infection. And then infection occurs and then weeks to months later, you get what's called an acute HIV infection. Somebody may feel like they have the flu and they'll probably assume that they have the flu. So they may or may not actually get tested at this point. Then there's going to be another lengthy uh, latent period. So again, during this H acute HIV infection, there's a very high viral load, but your T cell count is still fine. Over the years, those T cells will continue to be infected by new virions. It will actually ultimately destroy the T cells. So over the span of years without treatment, we will have a low T cell count. And at that point, that's what we call AIDS, right? Uh, a low T cell count, a high viral load is AIDS. And that person is immunodeficient and may develop any number of opportunistic infections. For example, herpes zoster is a form of herpes that spreads beyond the sort of oral or genital epithelium. It's going to be found in different epithelial sites. That's herpes zoster. Uh, oral hairy leukoplakia is this uh, sort of yellowing, this yellow tissue on the side of the tongue. Candida albicans. Everybody has candida yeast on them right now. That's really normal. But in an immunodeficient person, then it can become a systemic infection. And of course, our HIV-associated Kaposi sarcoma. This is why we called it gay cancer, that super hateful term, uh, because it's a form of cancer, it's a sarcoma, that, uh, is, that tends to take over in HIV-positive individuals as an opportunistic infection. These are not the only opportunistic infections. A common one that's going to ki kill a lot of people with AIDS is going to just be pneumonia. Getting the flu, getting the cold, you're immunocompromised. Yeah. Yes, there is a number. I don't know what that number is off the top of my head. Nice, less than 200. Well done. Raise your hand if you turned that. You're getting stickers. All right, awesome. Less than 200. I'm really, really happy about that. That's exciting. Okay, some other things that can happen uh, during the advancement into AIDS. HIV encephalopathy. So let's explain why HIV encephalopathy is going to happen. Uh, so there's going to be cytokine-related cellular damage. There's going to be the sort of inflammation response that can even impact the brain. Um, those viral products lead to cytokine release, which leads to inflammation, and that can result in damage directly to the brain in long-standing HIV infection. So another term for this would be AIDS dementia or HIV-associated dementia. Problems with concentration and memory and slowness of physical movements. So neurological manifestations. And again, this is about untreated HIV or undertreated or improperly treated HIV. Progressing into AIDS. So the goal, of course, is going to be consistent lifelong treatment and successful treatment, which is expensive. 
Awesome job with that one. All right, any questions about HIV? It's a big deal. Use protection, stay safe. So we'll move back into sort of order and into our hearts. We already did blood, which is a nice sort of coming into this. It is also really good to put inflammation right before we talk about coronary heart disease. Because as I mentioned in passing, we are starting to blame inflammation more and more for atherosclerotic plaque development. There's a reason I put it in this new order, and this is part of it. So coronary heart disease, also known as ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, just means we have thrombus formation within the coronary circulation. And there's going to be a progression here. Um, as you develop atherosclerotic plaque, in those coronary arteries. There can be a number of outcomes. The most mild would be angina pectoris, chest pain. And I believe we're gonna have a slide just for angina coming up. So just limiting the amount of blood to distal tissues is gonna cause referred pain patterns. If it completely blocks, we may develop a myocardial infarction. We're going to see how that could potentially lead to a dysrhythmia how that myocardial infarction and death of heart tissue can lead to heart failure, and all of that can lead to sudden cardiac death. On your worksheet, I'm gonna have you write up a timeline. If you're already in emergency medicine, you'll recognize that it's not a perfect timeline, but we're gonna contextualize it so that it'll be systemic and make sense. Okay, so coronary heart disease. Again, it's about thrombus formation. There's always the potential for coronary vasospasm. Something is partially occluded, then a sudden spasm is going to completely block it. This is something I hear quite a lot when we go to our autopsy visits, is even if they don't necessarily have a lot of atherosclerotic plaque, if we can't cause, find cause of death, we're going to suspect vasospasm as a cause of death. And of course, endothelial cell dysfunction, so more on that in a bit. When we measure somebody's cholesterol, Cholesterol is a, it's a complex molecule. It's got a fatty region and it's got a hydrophilic region. So hydrophilic and hydrophobic all in one. It's an important part of plasma membranes. It helps with stability of plasma membranes. So it's not the cholesterol we're measuring. Cholesterol itself is not the pr problem. The way you transport lipids is the problem. So you've got two major kinds of lipoproteins that we're actually measuring when we measure cholesterol. You have low-density lipoproteins and high-density lipoproteins. And there's going to be a specific way that I describe these lipoproteins. So both of these are transporting fats through the bloodstream. Fats are fat. They don't like water. Your blood's got a lot of water in it. So we can't just keep fats in there on their own. They need to be surrounded by a protein. That's what a lipoprotein is. So far so good? Okay. So your low-density lipoprotein, I'm going to compare these lipoproteins to workers at a construction site. There's going to be a really, really bad worker, and there's going to be a really, really good worker. The really, really good worker is the high-density lipoprotein. He does his job really well. He's going to cart those bricks exactly where they need to go. The low-density lipoprotein is going to be the lazy construction worker. Not only is he not going to transport the bricks where he should go, he's going to dump those bricks out into the walkway, and that's going to get into everybody else's way. So a low-density lipoprotein transports lipids, but tends to take them to the wrong place. They tend to dump them in the cardiovascular system, perhaps in a high-pressure area like the coronary arteries, really close to the heart. High-density lipoproteins are such an effective worker, not only are they going to cart their own lipids, their own bricks to the construction site, they're going to actually clean up the bricks dumped by the other guy. So we really like high density lipoproteins, we really don't like low density lipoproteins. That's why there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. This is one of those poorly understood things. So what I'm trying to do for you right now is give you a tool for, for patient education, right? How do you describe why HDL good, LDL bad, right? It's an efficient worker that'll even clean up everybody else's mess. It's a really inefficient worker that won't. And here's what it looks like when that LDL deposits fat into the coronary blood vessels. There's a sequence of events here, and there might be something on your worksheet I have to edit, but we'll see. 
Um, here's a sequence of events. You have deposition of fat into the vascular endothelium. It's actually going to permeate into the surrounding tissues right there. Here's your monocyte. Your monocyte's a type of macrophage. It detects an inflammatory event. There's cytokines because there's a sort of inflammatory event happening here. Remember, inflammation is very much to blame for atherosclerotic plaque development. That's what we're currently in the process of discovering. So cytokines invite our monocytes. They become macrophages. They try to clean up the fat. The big pile of bricks left behind. They're going to try to clean it up, but they're not going to be able to. They're going to be filled with fat droplets and then they're going to be too fat to move. Oh no. oh, no. So now we're going to look at a picture of a possum in a bakery. Very important. Possum in bakery. Look at autofills. OK, here's a possum in a bakery. It broke into this bakery, and it started eating sweets, and then I got so fat it couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> So the bakery owners come in in the morning and they just found their sin. Yes, it's like a English possum. You wish it was the honey badger. <laughs> Isn't it adorable? Okay, so now that your monocyte is completely full of lipids and unable to migrate back into the vascular bed, uh, we're going to call it a foam cell. So they take on this foamy appearance, and I think I have a histology image for some foam cells. It's not really in a vascular endothelium, but we'll deal with it. Uh, so when you're seeing these like teeny tiny little nuclei surrounded by a very pale cytoplasm, that cytoplasm is pale because it's fatty. So you've got foam cell infiltration is what we're saying. It's the possum, yes. Yeah. Correct. Uh, so the foam cell was caused because the monocyte was attracted chemically to this inflammatory event and it tried to clean up the fat and it couldn't. It consumed the fat and then it became immobile. So now it's a foam cell. Yeah, because now it's contributing to the mass of the thrombus. Exactly. You put a bunch of trash on an island, now the island's a mess. Absolutely. Because the fat that was placed here by the low density lipoprotein in the first place. Okay. I also want to point out you're going to have infiltration of some smooth muscle cells. They're going to actually migrate again to try to stabilize this thing. You like a stable plaque. If you're going to have a plaque, you prefer it to be stable which is our next conversation. Um, let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Again, cytokines attracting monocytes, monocytes becoming macrophages, consuming fatty streaks, infiltration of smooth muscle cells. I almost always forget to talk about the infiltration of smooth muscle cells, but you should know about it. I think I'm good. OK. So some plaques will be stable and some plaques will be unstable. If you're going to have a, a plaque, have a stable plaque if you've got a choice, right? Uh, stable plaques will have more collagen and fibrin. They'll be stabilized, which means they're less likely to break off. What do we call it when it breaks off? An embolus. We don't like it when things embolize. A vulnerable plaque will have a large lipid core. There's a lot of fat there, lots of foam cells. It'll have a thin cap and high shear stress. The velocity and blood pressure in that area is going to be very high. So this tends to be a multi-decade process, or at least it should be a multi-decade process. Um, so it starts with foam cells and a fatty streak. That, inter that lesion grows. We have that infiltration of smooth muscle and collagen. And now you're going to have a complicated lesion that could potentially rupture and embolize. Now again, just having that fibrous plaque there causes cystone problems. We are limiting the amount of blood making it through that blood, that blood vessel that can cause some sort of low-grade ischemia. I don't know if that's the right term, but that idea of limiting the blood distal to the side of that thrombus does cause its own problems, right? 
And then we worry about rupture and sending an embolus into a smaller blood vessel that would completely block it. Yes. Um, you would feel angina pectoris. You'd probably feel that right around here. You're already in the late stages when you're feeling chest pain. Yeah. It's a multi-decade process. That having been said, I may have mentioned this, I might not have. Two quarters ago, we saw a 27-year-old woman with 75% occluded coronary arteries. 27, younger than me. Um, now, some people have really weird cholesterol issues that are genetic, right? Maybe you genetically have LDL, that's very, very high. And so you'd be very, very prone to it. But here in America, we're also gonna worry about the dietary element in addition to the genetic component. Remember, you need a vulnerable person and an environmental trigger for many diseases, not just autoimmune, right? So maybe you have the genetic basis, but your diet is also bad because you live in America. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. Uh, so diet absolutely has an impact on just the quantity of fat that you carry. It's not going to change your genes to determine how much HDL, LDL you have genetically, right? Um, but the sheer quantity of saturated fats that Americans get is just very high. And really, we're exporting our diet around the world. I shouldn't say USA anymore. Yes. Would I'm not entirely sure. Good question. Yes. Don't do that test after all of them. That sounds about right. Yeah. I agree with that assessment. Don't take your cholesterol tests after going to the Olive Garden. Even with genetic issues, I'm lower. My husband has yeah. that really bad. Yeah. Making sure right. every time you go to the doctor, it gets lower and lower. Good. Yeah. So changing your diet will absolutely impact it. There are medications for which this is a target, right? That's part of why you're learning it, because it's going to tie into pharmacology. Um, I mean, report back to me. I never hear about what she says about it, but um, yeah, this is going to be a major target for pharmacology. Can we lower their LDL? Can we raise their HDL? Because if we have HDL, remember, it can help clear this out. We can improve this. And also diet and exercise can improve this. Um, obviously, it's a multi-decade process, so rep repairing it would also be a multi-decade process. We only have so many decades. So it's best to just eat healthy all of your life. That's the real goal. That having been said, knowing this, I eat sugar every day. So... Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm way into cookies. It's ridiculous. I can't. I can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> cookies and cake. Right now I have coffee cake and chocolate truffles at home. And I'm, I'm excited. I'm definitely going to eat both when I get home. <laughs> can't stop me. Uh, we are finding sugar is a major player in inflammation. I will eventually have a, a slide that shows you how glucose levels interact with the vascular endothelium and directly cause inflammation. So again, knowing this, I'm a sugar addict and I can't stop. So. It's really bad. <laughs> Don't eat sugar every day like I do. You can stop it. Meat. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna pause because I'm gonna get into a nutritional discussion that's gonna go sideways. That's actually a good time to stop. It's about time to send you on break anyway.